In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives, amen. I take great comfort in the fact that the disciples are uh, continuously portrayed in the Gospels as not getting it. Um, as is, and it happens today in today's Gospel reading. And I think I take comfort in it because I, too, feel like I often don't get it um, entirely. Uh, what happens right before this Gospel reading is Jesus has started already talking about going away. And Peter says to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? You know, like, I will go with you. It's like, I will lay down my... And Jesus says to him, well, where I'm going, you cannot, you cannot come. And Peter's like, well, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, really? You will lay down your life for me. Before the night ends, the cock will crow three times and you will deny me. And this is all happening on the eve before Jesus' crucifixion. It's at the Last Supper, at that last table. That's when Jesus then says the beginning of today's text, do not let your hearts be troubled. You know, I'm going to my Father's house. There are many dwelling places. I'm going there and you know the way to the place where I'm going. And I love what Thomas says. Thomas is like, Lord... <laughs> We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You've got to show us a map. You've got to kind of give us directions. You have to tell us where you're going if you want us to be there. And, I'll, and I hear his desire to get it. His desire is to want to be with Jesus, right? His, he's, he's not doubting. He's not skeptical. He's saying, Lord, you're being unclear here. How, how do we get to where you're going? And then Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As if that clarified Thomas's dilemma, or at least in his mind, right? I mean, I can imagine him just sitting there thinking, but how is it that a person is a way? How is it that a, a person is truth? How is it that a person is the life? Right? We, we've heard those words, you know. All, I mean, this is not the first time we've heard those words. We hear those words all the time, and they have now with them the... the, the there's a sense of familiarity with them, and I think sometimes the familiarity masks the bewilderment that's underneath them. Like, what does that mean? Because Thomas certainly doesn't get it, and, and then Philip also doesn't get it. I mean, Philip, even though Jesus has just said it, Philip is like, well, Lord, if, if you're going to the Father, just show us the Father, and we will be satisfied, because then we'll know the way to get to where you're going. He doesn't get it either. And Jesus is like, how can you say the Father? Don't you know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Again, as if that cleared their confusion. I mean, I, I hear those words. I love those words. I love these stories. And I'm not sure, though, that I always get it. You know, I, I have a master's degree from a famous university, and I'm an ordained priest, and I'm supposed to somehow get it and, and somehow be the one to kind of knows it and is supposed to help other people get it too, as if getting it was, you know, what's at stake here. And I'm not sure that getting it necessarily is. I mean, there are, lot, there are people that, that do think, that, oh, you need to get it, right? Jesus is the truth. You need to, you know, you need to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and, you know, say a sinner's prayer and you need to kind of make sure you got good theology so that you understand what's going on. I mean, you know, I, sometimes I want to say, okay, well, then what does it mean for Jesus to be the way? And they're like, no, Jesus is the truth. And I'm like, well, okay. But what does it mean for Jesus to be the way? And they're like, Jesus is the truth. And I'm like, okay, what does it mean for Jesus to be the life? And they're like, Jesus is the truth. <laughs> You're like, okay. I get that you believe that Jesus is the truth. That's good. It just feels incomplete somehow. You know, there's other folks who are like, oh, Jesus is the way. You know, it's all about action. It's all about what you do. It's not about what you believe. It's about what you do and how you live your life out. Faith without works is dead. I'm like, okay. You know, what does that like, look like? And I, I, for some people, it's about holy living. It's about being righteous, right? It's about living a life that, that is worthy of honor and respect. It's about, you know, not doing things that denigrate the soul. It's about not gambling and not getting caught up in substance abuse and not you know, uh, not watching dirty movies, right? It's about righteous living. You know, at the other end of, of that spectrum is, is it's, it's more about working for justice and doing social justice. It's about taking Matthew 25 seriously. It's like Matthew 25 Christians. Matthew 25 is that book in, I mean, at the, it's a story Jesus is telling. It's a vision Jesus is telling in the book of Matthew around the last judgment. 
And it, Jesus is saying there will come a day when all of humanity will be gathered and Jesus will be there separating them out into two groups, the sheep and the goats. And Jesus will turn to the sheep and he'll say, welcome to my kingdom. And he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you cared for me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. And the sheep are bewildered. They're like, really? <laughs> when, when, when did we do that? And Jesus is like, well, whenever you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then he turns to the goats and he says, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. When I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and you didn't care for me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. And he says to them, you're not part of the kingdom. Right? That's a word we need to hear right now. Like, we're moving into time when, you know, there are more, more and more people who are hungry and thirsty and they need some, They need clothing. There, there are more and more people who need the, 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 the kindness of strangers. You know, there are more people who are, who are sick and they need care. And we're fortunate up here in Canada that you can lose your job and, and you can be poor here in Canada and still get good health care. That's a great thing about this society. And it's not true down south. South of the border, people are losing their jobs at a time when they need health care and they're losing health care. Right? And that's something that Christians who want to follow Jesus as the way should be concerned about. Right now, prisoners, prisoners are stuck in, in situations and meat packers are stuck in situations where, you know, they're getting exposed, you know, their exposure, their level of exposure to COVID has increased. That is something that we should be concerned about. We should be concerned about the prisoners. Or at least that's what Jesus is saying because he's saying, I am there in the midst of them. So there's something about Jesus as a way, right? But that can be, that can also be imbalanced at, at some level. You, so you talk to people and say, well, okay, what does it mean for Jesus is the truth? And they're like, well, Jesus is the way. It's about fighting injustice. It's about living a holy life. They're like, oh, okay, well, what does it mean to, 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 to follow Jesus' life? And it's like, no, Jesus is the way. And then there's others who are like, no, Jesus is the life. You need to accept him as your Lord and Savior and enter into a personal relationship with Jesus. Like you need to be open to the Holy Spirit and, and being born again and in, in the gifts of the Spirit. You know, and there's, a, there's other Christians who also you know, are in, do believe that it's about this experience of the divine, but they use different language. They talk about you know, communion with the divine. And they look at passages like John 14, the one we're just reading, where Jesus says, I am, you know, I am in the Father and the Father is in me and we are in you. Abide in me as we abide in you. And Paul talks about the indwelling of Christ. And so these people talk about mystical communion and the indwelling of Christ. And you know, people like Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bergeau and, you know. They're all part of this, you need to experience, have this lived experience and this lived encounter with a living God. Ah, that's good too. But you know, in the end, it feels like Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And there's something about the balance of all of them that, that somehow is the walk of faith, that somehow is the, the walk of following Jesus. And you know, sometimes I get it, and sometimes I, I feel like I get it, and sometimes, and, and I do it imperfectly. I, I don't know if I fully get it. It feels like sometimes my humanity is, is very real, and I bring myself with me wherever I go. That's why I like, actually, our first reading, too, from Peter. You know, last week when we were talking about this reading from Peter, I realized Peter is writing to a community of people who are aliens and exiles, He's writing to a community of people who, 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 who know slavery, who are slaves. Actually, they have to do somebody else's bidding. These are people who have been uprooted from, you know, community. They don't have, you know, years of knowing the people around them. They don't have decades of being in a place where they've developed a web of relationships. They've been uprooted and deracinated and taken to a place where they're strangers and aliens and exiles, and they're having to do somebody else's bidding. They don't have freedom. They don't have full political access. They've been beaten. They've been unjustly I mean, the, the, the injustice is happening, right? These are people who have suffered. 
people who have known trauma. And now they're part of this new community. They, 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 they've heard about the good shepherd. They've heard about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. And, and they're struggling to follow who, you know, struggling to follow Jesus. And they're meeting together in community. And apparently, you know, there they are. And they bring themselves with them in all their human, humanity. And they're being malicious. <laughs> they've got guile. They're, 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 not, they're, they're, they're deceiving. They're, not, they're being deceptive in their talk. They're, they're not being sincere in their interactions with each other. They're full of envy, and, and they tend to slander each other and pull each other down. And, you know, Peter is like, oh, this isn't really conducive to good community, right? This isn't, this isn't really the kind of church we want to have. And, you know, and yet this particular church that Peter is writing to seems to be rife with malice and guile and insincerity and envy and slander. And so Peter's like, don't do that. Stop. You know, rid yourself of malice. Be kind. Right? Instead of deception and guile and trying to mislead somebody, tell the truth. Don't be insincere. Be authentic. Be real. You know, when your brother or sister has been successful and, and has, has, you know, has achieved something, don't be envious. Bless them. You know, be, great, be grateful for what's happened to them. Don't pull them down. Even, when, even if you disagree with somebody, don't slander them. Tell the truth about who they are. Respect them. Guard their dignity. Protect them. And then Peter uses this very curious metaphor. He invites them to consider themselves as being newborn. He's like, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. Or he, he's inviting these, these, these adults, right, who, who feel like they're mature, these jaded, hurt, scarred, broken adults. He's inviting them to consider themselves as being like newborns, suckling at a mother's breast, right? drinking pure spiritual milk from the mother's breast. Right? That's the metaphor he uses. I don't know, I mean, a lot about infants, but I've been told that they don't have very good eyesight, that they really can only see the distance from being placed in the crook of their mother's arm at the breast into the mother's face. And so as they're suckling and as they're being fed by the mother's body, right, the mother's body is feeding their body, which is an amazing thing to think about, that her milk is their food. And they're being satisfied by that. And you're meant to imagine that the mother is looking down, right, with this profound sense of love, right? There, I mean, her hormone, I mean, there are neurochemicals going on in her brain that have made her fall madly in love with this little creature here suckling at her breast, and she would do anything for this little creature. She is madly in love, and she's delighting in what, what's happening here. And as she's looking down and looks into the child's eyes, the child's, the infant's eyes gaze up at hers, and the infant feels the love. The infant feels the delight. And the infant, in turn, delights in that love. There's a psychoanalyst I like named Jessica Benjamin who she calls that mutual recognition. There's that moment where the mother sees the infant and the infant sees the mother and they both delight in each other and there's such a profound love for each other. And there's this communion that happens, this inner subjectivity that is foundational in shaping us and being people who have the capacity to love the capacity to have relationship, like we need that mutual gaze of delight and compassion and care that happens in that moment. That's what Peter is inviting these folks into. He's saying this is the foundation. Drink that pure spiritual milk. That's what will save you, right? This, this is what will feed you and, and make you become living stones like Christ, the cornerstone, right? It was a living stone. That's, that's an oxymoron. That's a paradox. I mean, stones have solidity and weight, right? But, but rather than being dead and hard, these stones have breath. These stones have life. These stones have love. That's what makes them solid and secure and a foundation, 
for being what God is up to, like being a foundation for the kingdom of God in this world. That's our invitation. It's to let ourselves consider being born anew and drinking that pure spiritual milk.